So approach to the patient. Uh, this is something that uh, some of you may get annoyed about uh, because um, we have two jobs. We basically have, uh, and the jobs have um, the clinical care. And with it, uh, after this morning session is over, we're going to be heavy into clinical care. And um, then there's this issue about making the patients glad that I came here and I appreciate your, what you did for me. And the third thing is how efficient you are. You can't be seeing one patient an hour. You know those. Those are the three things that determine your success in emergency medicine. So let's talk a little bit about approach to the patient. So I was the director of a community hospital for 25 years. Um, we saw, it was a single uh, physician in the department and the, the, we had uh, nurse practitioners and PAs in the last three or four years that I, we were there. And um, we admitted 20% of our patients, which is pretty much the national average. And so in, in many ways, it was the, you know, the typical emergency department in the community. Um, a couple of things in terms of the, the approach to these patients. Number one, the, uh, you never get a second chance to make a first impression, and that's particularly true in emergency medicine. You have about five nanoseconds to make it clear to this person that I'm your advocate, I'm, gonna, I'm here to help you, um, I'm glad you're here. Uh, and, I, and many times, we're not really glad you're there. You know, you're, you, <laughs> but you know, if, if you ever go to Disney, they have all of these people around in, in outfits, you know, and they're always happy and playful and, you know, they take care of your kids. You know, those people probably are often miserable, but they're not allowed the opportunity to show their misery uh, because their job basically says, I have to be happy and playing with the kids and be Mickey Mouse. And so that's not your option either. So if you're having an argument with your wife, you've got some financial problems, you've got a tax audit kind of thing, you can't bring that to work because people just don't want to see it. And uh, that's one of the skill sets of being the exemplar. We're, ta we're really trying to talk about creating exemplary emergency providers, exemplary. So this is the part that you may not like, but you're, the guys who write your paycheck think that this is extraordinarily important. So the idea is, is that you never get a second chance to make a first impression. You are going in there and you're going to make a great first impression. And you need to know the medicine. And they basically kind of assume that you know the medicine. Uh, but, uh, and one of the things that I think is a kind of an interesting concept is they know about uh, um, one thing. They know about whether you care. They don't know about your ability to pro provide care in terms of th do I need this test or that kind of, or do I need this drug? But they are able to judge the quality of the caring. Patient's expectation in the emergency department. I think you have to remember that most people who go to the emergency department are anxious. They're afraid. I wonder what I have. I hope it's not serious or um, my, I'm concerned about my baby and I couldn't get in to see my doctor kind of thing. Um, the, a person, you, many times you can see a person who, this person is the president of a big, huge company. But he comes in, he gets this $3,000 Armani suit off, gets a gallon that doesn't cover his tush, lays down on the bed, becomes horizontal, and he basically becomes a needy person. He becomes somebody who is not uh, powerful any longer. Uh, we strip that away from them very quickly. And so the idea is, is that they are anxious. Just assume that they are. They are worried. Just assume that they are. Because it's so easy to get callous about this and say, ah, geez, weren't you here last week? You know, McDonald's never says, are you, here? are you hungry again? Weren't you here last week? They don't say that. They say, glad to see you back again, kind of thing. Here, you're an ER abuser, you know. Bad, bad, bad. So the idea is that the department has this goal of creating a positive experience. Waiting times are an embarrassment in emergency medicine. And finally, CMS, after 50 bajillion years, has said, we're going to measure how quickly you see your patients and how quickly you process your patients. And so now, <clears throat> basically, they want to know <clears throat> door to provider. And that's not door to triage, that's door to you. And, um, and, and yet, I don't know, some of you probably have uh, waiting times where a door to provider times of 15 minutes. And if you have a door to provider time average of 15 minutes, can I see your hands? 
Okay, because there are places that have done it. You can't say it's impossible. Now, I'm going to ask uh, any of you have daughter provider times of two hours. And, and, and the answer is there's tons of you who do, but you just don't want to raise your hand. But the fact is there's two hours, three hours. Those are unacceptable, unacceptable. And the fact of the matter is, is that we are the only industry that I know of that puts up billboards saying, here's how long you're going to have to wait to come into our department kind of thing. You've seen these billboards all over the place. It's an embarrassment that we would do that, that we haven't fixed the problem. So what we do is we put up, the one that they put up for our hospital was fast ER, like the word faster, fast, and the ER is like in separate kind of thing. They didn't do a damn thing to make the place faster, but they just said, you come on in and you'll think it's faster. <laughs> and you've seen these things, the, and, the, and the websites and all of this stuff, these are all workarounds. The workarounds basically wouldn't need to be there if, in fact, patients coming in would see a physician or a, a PA or a nurse practitioner in a reasonable amount of time. Certainly a half hour, no longer than that. Half hour is the average wait at your place. That's okay. It's not fabulous. Not, but you're talking about they wait an hour, they wait two hours. Out of control department, out of control department, especially when we talk about what those patients are being charged to be there. You need to take a look at your patient's bills, and you will be absolutely floored at the bills. Go through the, have one of your relatives go through, you know, basically, and look at, look at the bill. That IV that you started, which was kind of casually done, they didn't really need it. It's $200. That bag cost a dollar. The hospital converts it to $200 for that. CAT scan, $1,000. How long did it take? It took five minutes to do that CAT scan. That machine is paid for in six months. But the fact of the matter is, is that we need, this, we need to fix this problem in terms of um, patient waiting. Our industry, you ask patients what they think, they say you will wait when you go to ER. You don't wait when you go to Nordstrom's, you don't wait when you go to McDonald's, you don't wait, to, we don't wait anywhere, but you wait when you go to ER. Even though you're sick, you got pain, you're bleeding. So uh, there's all these workarounds. I think that this would be fixed tomorrow if the CEO's bonuses were related to how quickly patients were seen in the emergency department. Did you see this one pay where, you, where you can pay uh, to, um, it's called in quicker, it's just one of the, there's other companies, where you pay 15 to $25, and they'll call you up when your uh, appointment is ready, and you can come then, and you don't have to wait in the, uh, in the waiting room with all the unwashed masses, and you can just stay at home and have a pizza when, you're in, when your time's ready, we'll give you a call. That's, that's unbelievable. So hospitals have adopted this. There's hundreds of hospitals have adopted this program kind of thing so that people can call in and make an appointment for the emergency department. Now, what does Amtala say about that? There's some concern about what Amtala says about that. And what do the other patients think that when you walk in, uh, up into the front of the line and say, hey, hey we've been, where are you, what's the story? You're just walking in and we've been here? So I think there's some real issues with that, but, the, but people are doing it. The, the real way is fix the problem, no wait. Meeting pa patients' expectation, two things. Basically, the department has to have policies and procedures that are focused on creating a positive experience. And then the staff basically has to say, we're going to embrace them, and I'm going to create a positive experience for you. So there's two things. So how many of your departments basically, go, they go to the window. Oh, by the way, the window is two-inch bulletproof thick lucite because everybody's afraid that the patient's going to blow the department away with an Uzi machine gun. These, these departments have become armed fortresses. There's bulletproof lucite all over in the back door. You go in the front door, there's no bulletproof lucite there. They got the big donor wall, the nice big, big chairs, the, the, the uh, candy stripers are all there to advise you around there, you know. Go in the back, holy smokes, these must be criminals we're going to be seeing back here. Bad. Talk about never getting a second chance to make a first impression. Bad and first impressions. Talk through the glass. Talk through the thing. What's wrong with you? Um, slip in your Medicaid car here. And, you know, don't touch me. So the, 
as an example, many emergency departments, you go to the window, you say, I'd like to be seen. Okay, so fine, okay. You go over here, go see, see the triage nurse. The triage nurse determines that you're going to live. So you'll go back at the waiting room. And the EMT comes out, picks you up from the waiting room, and brings you into, into a bed where another nurse asks you the same questions that that triage nurse asked, which are largely irrelevant anyway. And the fifth person to see you is you or the doctor, the provider, the fifth person. You'll never get a door to provider time in 15 minutes if you follow that traditional, classic way that you get into an emergency department. You can't do that. You've got to think outside the box. We're not going to do it that way anymore. At our hospital, when we had an open bed, there was no triage. That person came to the window, I could be seen, bam, in they went. Our doctor basically, we, we, every one of them was tracked in terms of their door to provider time. We could easily get 15 minutes, you, but you can't do it when you have five people, people be, uh, to see the person before you, you walk in the room. So door to provider now is being measured. Uh, CMS says we want to know, and it's, and it's to you, not to the trash nurse. So the bottom line is, is the clock's running. You basically got to get off your butt and say, hey, there's a new patient in bed six. I want to go in there. And obviously, you don't have to do the um, whole kit and caboodle. Uh, the, the, you know, people have tried to do the provider and triage. There's been success stories with that. There's also been failures with it. It's all in the details of how you do it, where the provider is in triage and is able to see the patients quickly. You have to staff it adequately. If the provider's in triage, that provider needs a nurse, that provider needs a tech. And in the end, yet you see some of these nutty hospitals. Oh, we got rid of all the techs anymore. This is an all RN department. If any of you have an all RN department, it's like, what are you thinking about? That means the nurse gets the blanket for the patient. The nurse walks the patient to the bathroom. The nurse makes the phone call. The, the, the $50 an hour nurse that makes all of these calls. It should have been done by the tech. This move to get rid of techs in the department is fundamentally a mistake. Oh, we're very proud, all in the RN department. You're a nut. So provider and triage and fast tracks, they're all great ideas to try to allow the quick patients to be seen quickly. So basically, you have to have a sense of urgency because you're going to be measured. Uh, and at our hospital, there was a big, you know, the bell-shaped curve, and it was pretty clear at the beginning, well, oh, this doctor just doesn't want to play because he worked the same shifts and he worked the night shifts and basically he just wasn't getting off his or her butt in a timely manner to go visit the patient. And this is, this is quick. It's, hi, Mr. So-and-so, I understand that you got some belly pain. Uh, are you having any pain? Uh, let me take a little quick little look here. Um, let me get you something for that pain. Here's what I think we ought to do. I'm going to come back and see you later, but in the meantime, let's get some stuff started to get you comfortable and we're going to get a few tests. Done. That was it. That's your door to provider. That took one minute, uh, two minutes at most. Then you can go back and ask the 35 uh, review systems, all the other systems, negative, the great lie, and all that other stuff. You can do that later, you know? Um, but that, that initial bam, great first impression, you, you got in there quickly, um, works really well. They like you. What you. Doctor, do you have a private practice? Soon as they say that, man, you just hit the ball out of the frickin' park. <laughs> because it means, I like you, doctor. I want you to be my doctor. And then you say, private practice? What are you, nuts? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. I'm working here. So these are the, some of the key times that uh, basically you're going to be told more and more of these. The median uh, time for ED arrival to uh, departure, so they want to know how long your patients are staying in the department who are going home. 80% of your patients go home. Those are the ones that kind of matter, to tell you the truth. The ones that are going to be admitted to the hospital, they're going to be there for days. So the, really the time, the clock is running on the ones who can leave. And those are the ones that you have the most influence over. Once somebody's admitted, you have this whole issue of, well, the bed's not ready. Somebody's got to clean the bed. You know, there's somebody in the bed. There's a dead body in the bed. We're going to you know, deal with that kind of thing, you know. So a lot of that is out of your hands. What is not out of your hands is the throughput of the patients who go home. Um, you know, we sometimes kind of think that uh, they, they say, well, why don't you go to your family doctor? 
and that's another translated is why are you come in here but the fact is the literature has said that patients who go to emergency department have self-selected themselves they are different than the ones who go to a doctor's office as an example there was a study basically said chest pain in doctor's office more often GERD than not chest pain in ER more often coronary artery disease headache in the emergency department bad headache in the emergency department they don't subarachnoid hemorrhages don't walk into family physicians offices they come to you so so we are the worst first people and and um, there is a, there is you know there is this difference they are they're not the same as the ones who are going to doctors offices or something else is going on and I think any time a person comes to the emergency department I get I kind of give them the benefit of the doubt because it's like uh, you want to go through this whole process where we uh, have you uh, wait for two hours before we see you and have you talk to four or five people through the bulletproof glass you want to go through all of that just to see me then there, maybe there is something wrong that is that I need to be particularly careful about so we are the worst first people like we're looking in for these life-threatening things um, vital signs I know I know that you think this is a little nutty we have a half hour talking vital signs virtually every lawsuit that you're going to get into is, is going to it's going to there's a set of vital signs on there that you didn't notice that's going to nail you um, and so Billy Mal is going to talk about it in the in the context of how important they are um, and hopefully give you a, a bunch of uh, little tips here so you, vital signs vital signs life Vetus life these are life signs um, and you know you need to know the high risk complaints which we're going to talk about for the rest of this three and a half days general approach to the patient you know look at this we're, we're worse first so we look at the serious things we look at for the what's the most likely thing we look for the things that are interesting that we can treat kind of thing but we're worse first people and you know many times family physicians criticize the emergency department staff oh you guys get too many tests kind of thing you know do you don't you don't you recognize a case of ump when you see it those doctors in the in their office have not seen a subarachnoid hemorrhage their doctors in the office have not seen a meningitis the doctors in the office have not seen the cases of um, um, bacterial this back thing would it help me out here the name thank you very much doctor I was having a little you know <laughs> spinal epidural abscess they don't see them in the you miss a spinal epidural abscess write the check you're in trouble so and Greg will be talking about that and here and here's this issue about you know about the the approach of the patient which I think is so, so important I, I, I've, I've written columns basically that said that every one of you should have an organ removed every four years. <laughs> You're all insured. Uh, the hospitals could use the money, and you need to be on the other side of the of the gurney rail. You need to be horizontal. And you know, as you get older, you get to experience being what it like, is like to be a patient. And the younger ones of you are, you you know, you're going to live forever. You're you know you're, you know. But that, 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 it doesn't work that way. So as you get older, you want to start consuming health care. But the problem with us is we always get special treatment. We, we are, if we could go in and, as an uh, anonymous patient, oh, that would be great. But no, as soon as they know you're a, one, one of them, you get special treatment. So we, we're, we're never really experiencing how, at how the patients really do. Prescani, most of you will bristle at the word Prescani. I can't stand it. The fact of the matter is, is that when an obstetrician brings his patient to the hospital to deliver, they've had a relationship now for six months. They are buddies, kind of thing. They've, they've established a relationship. I like my doctor. And the same thing is for the family doctors. And you're going to have your gallbladder out. Well, I met the doctor. At the uh, surgeon was recommended to me. And I met him. I liked him. My family doctor likes that surgeon. So we trust that doctor kind of thing. They know nothing about you. And you're walking in cold. And, they've got, and they're scared. And they don't know who you are and how competent you are and whether you're going to give a rat's ass about them. And this, so they, I don't blame companies for doing the survey. I wrote checks to doctors for 25 years. This is one of the three things that mattered. Is your medicine good? Do the patients like you? And are you fast? That's all that matters. And you can get fired for any one of those three, three things. So, the, so this is, 
you need to know how to do this. This is an open book test. You get these whatever thing, you post it on the wall. Here's what they're looking for. It's not, you know, they're going to say, does the doctor introduce himself? Does the, do they ask about pain? Do they apologize for the weight? Do they say something about your privacy? Do they, you know, it's, this, is a, this, is, this is idiots. You look at the survey and you, and you play to the survey. It's an open book test. You cannot screw this up. Obviously, you know, there's this issue about looking the part. And um, you have to realize that most of the patients, you know, are getting are older. You know, you know, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80. You don't need to dress for the 18-year-old. You need to dress for, the, you know, the 60-year-old who's going to want to know, can I trust this person? And so, you know, appearances matter. The white coat gets a lot of mileage. Oh, a lot of mileage. There's been all kinds of studies about what, you know, and yeah, you can wear scrubs, but the white coat gets a lot of mileage. And, you know, you could put certain uh, pieces of hardware through various body parts, but avoid the bone through the nose if you could, you know, kind of thing. Um, big smile certainly helps. Name, introduction, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be your doctor. I'm Dr. So-and-so or I'm PA so-and-so. I'm going to be taking care of you. There's this literature that says um, as soon as they start talking, you interrupt in 20 seconds so they don't get to say very much because you interrupt right away because you're in a big hurry. Um, Nonverbal communication. So what are you here for today? Nonverbal co communication represents, depending on how you read this stuff, 60 or 70 percent of the message that you transfer is in their nonverbal communication. Um, and it's not about you. You can't say, you know, I, my mother-in-law had the same kind of thing. Here's how how's it went, you know. Studies have looked at that. Basically, they don't want to hear about your mother-in-law. Um, touching. Jeez, I think this is really important. This person who is the president of a company, who's a millionaire, who's laying in front of you kind of thing, is scared. Is this appendicitis? Is it my heart doctor kind of thing? And a, a hand on that person's forearm goes a long way into saying, I'm with you, man. I'm going to take care of it. We're, we're, we're in this together. You know, a hand on the shoulder of grandma does, a, does wonders. Qualified translator. Medicare requires you to have a qualified translator uh, later. It's not an option. Do not use the housekeeper if you need Spanish. Don't do that. The hospitals know this now. A qualified translator is a, tr a person who's been tested to see whether they know how to do this. It's, uh, it, and now, there's, is, now there are even certified translators. Um, so you get, make, make sure you get that. The, a cool thing to do in terms of style points, as soon as you walk in the door, say, I apologize for the wait. The wait could be two minutes. But as soon as you say, I apologize for the wait, it acknowledges that uh, this person's time is valuable. And um, they say, they all say, oh, it was nothing, doctor. You know, but it means that you were concerned about the weight, even if it's if it's input. This is a whole set of skills that you can master. Allow the patient to talk. We talked about that. One of the things that they don't like is they don't like you looking up stuff in some kind of ectopic brain. Uh, let me figure out the dose of that stuff here. They, uh, studies have been done at that. They're not interested in you doing that because it, it affects your credibility in terms of it, what you know about the stuff. And the other thing is that now is becoming an issue is your backs to them as you're typing into this computer, the electronic medical record, otherwise known as the invention of the devil. <laughs> your work should be facilitated. You now are sitting down, entering data, you should be. You should. You should not. You should not touch a pen. You should have a scribe. You should have two scribes. You should have a tech and two scribes and four nurses kind of thing. <laughs> you should. You should be. Intel, you should be free floating intellect, so, <laughs> supported with a whole support team there. Now your data entry people. It, where are they? Where are they going? Um, you got to do a good history. 
It's part of the show. Greg will tell you about the show. You never examine a kid without the mother in the room, and when the mother's in the room, then the show begins. And then you do all this and exam, and they expect a thorough exam. You look in the ears, ears are maybe irrelevant. Oh, it looks, it looks good, Mom. Uh, I don't see any evidence of de dehydration. Lungs are clear, heart's fine, belly's nice and soft, moves to all his, his extremities well, don't see any rash or anything like that. Oh, what a good doctor, what a good doctor. What crap, but you know. Uh, <laughs> it's the show, and they expect the show. There's a stethoscope, use the damn thing. There's, a, there's that little rubber hammer, whack something. <laughs> Nurses should offer, offer chaperones, have a low threshold for having those chaperones offered. Don't, the doctor should not ask the patient if you want a chaperone, Don't, that, that's not right community. Ask the nurse should ask, ask that kind of thing. Always assume the patient is in pain. There's a great study that basically looked, oh, I got four minutes in. The great study that looked at patients who came to the hospital with COPD. Substantial number of those patients who have COPD have, have chronic pain. They're old. They have arthritis. Their back hurts. Ask them if they have pain. They'll appreciate your being concerned about it. Tell them what the plan of care is. You see these guys just leave the room. Everybody's looking around. What the, what's going on? No, you say, okay, here, Mr. So-and-so, we're going to get you this IV for your fluids. We're going to get you something for your pain. We're going to start, we're going to get eight CAT scans, and I'll be back in three days. <laughs> you got to visit them frequently. This is a mistake. You cannot visit them hourly. You've got to visit them every half hour. Just tell them what's going on kind of thing. Deal tactfully with requests. Why aren't you doing a CAT scan in, uh, my, in, in, in Johnny? Um, well, to tell you the truth, the reason I, I don't think we ought to do it is because, first of all, there's a lot of radiation with a CAT scan. He had, his injury was about four hours ago. He hasn't vomited. I checked him out neurologically. He's very, I, you know, you saw the great neurologic exam I did. And here's, here's the hooker. And to tell you the truth, if Johnny was my son, I wouldn't do it. Once you take that from the, from the generic to the personal, if Johnny was my son, I wouldn't do it. That means you're taking them into the inner confidence that says, I'm not going to treat you like all the other slobs. I'm telling you what I would do with my kid. They actually think that you would treat your kid well, but, you know, <laughs> what a delusion. <laughs> but, don't, but, but, but that goes really, that, that works really well. And uh, they basically want an explanation. Well, why aren't you going to do it? Then that, they want your time. Well, you got to watch for HIPAA here kind of thing. You've got to watch your... Greg will talk about that and all the ways now with all this media stuff that people are getting in trouble, taking pictures and posting this. And, and these hospitals, zero tolerance. You get caught, you're out. And uh, signing out patients, I, I want to... Um, I don't understand this. You go to the, 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 the changes shift, all the nurses are talking around in one spot. Well, that's when they had paper charts. I have no idea how, when, how they do it when there's a computer. But when they had paper charts, they were all talking around for 20 minutes. Oh, we're having a report kind of thing. Um, the way that ought to be done is the way the doctors do it. We, we did this at our hospital. The doctor basically would take the incoming doctor go into the patient's room and say, Mr. So-and-so, this is Dr. Smith. He's going to be taking over. I've explained what's going on to him. I explained that we're waiting for a call from your family doctor and the results of the CAT scan, and he's going to take over your care. He's a great doctor, and he, he's... He, mm -mm. That's, the way tra that's the way this should be done, not at the desk, for, you know? Have you ever seen this thing where they basically, the new doctor comes in and says, oh, the other doctor's off duty. What? How would you like to be treated like that? The other doctor's off duty. I'm, got, I'm sick here. I need to know that there's, there's a, 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 you know, a, a passing on of the baton here. And the nurse at, at our hospital, state of California, one nurse for every four patients. They only got four. The nurse should take their, you know, here's a new nurse. I'm going to introduce you to my four patients, for crying out loud. What, why wouldn't you not do that? I, I want to end here. This is a survey that, um, that is required of the feds. It's related only to admitted patients, but since half the patients in the hospital are admitted through the ED, these survey questions can be asked of, your exper of their experience with you. Now, I didn't want to read those. They're there, but you can see that 
this federal survey, which is, going to, which is posted on the Internet about what people think of your hospital, you may be, in fact, a substantial contributor to the good part or the bad part of the questions that are being asked in this survey. And then you go into your hospital, go to hospitalcompare.gov and look at all that, what they said about your hospital. So I want to stop here. That's, um, that's mostly it. I know that that was a lot of philosophy. I know that annoys some of you, but it's really about what this job is, is, is it, it's, it's what it's about.